So I'm going to be talking about what is a comprehensive assessment system in public school. So how many of you work with public school or are in public school? Yay, thank you. How many of you are in private practice? How many are in private schools? Okay, administrators, coaches, classroom teachers, therapists, any parents that are sitting here? Okay, so mainly oh, a few parents, and hopefully um, you'll understand some of the conversations or uh, topics that we talk about in, in vocabulary. And then the second part, I'm going to take uh, you through what, what do you do with that data and how does that drive your decisions about effective reading instruction if you're in a public school system or if you're in a private setting. Okay, if you don't know of the Council of Chief State School Officers, this is um, when the college and career readiness standards were created. This is the organization that helped write it. <laughs> okay, so since then they created documents that support the Common Core standards that a lot of the states um, use or have adopted or adapted uh, actually. This one I use to talk about what is a comprehensive assessment system to really look at what do the researchers talk about it and how do administrators think about it. So I want you to put in the lens of your administrator. What do they know? Whether or not they're a reading uh, instructional leader or are they a high school PE teacher who's now an administrator or a business person who's now an administrator. So this CCSSO document kind of looked at compre uh, a comprehensive assessment system in these types of assessments. So first you have summative, then you have universal screeners or benchmarks, you have diagnostic, you have progress monitoring, and you have formative. So we're going to be talking about each one of those briefly. Um, and I want you to be thinking about it, not only the, how I define it or how they define it, but what type of assessments fit in that um, description. So first of all, summative. So I want you to get close to a partner, someone near you, and I want you to get into groups of two or three. Say hello. Okay, so you found your partner. I want you to decide who's going to be one, who's going to be two, who's going to be three. And ones. I'd like you to turn to your partners and tell them one measure you consider as your summative. What is the one measure that you consider as your summative assessment as we go into this de definition, okay? So what is a summative um, assessment? Summatives provide information regarding level of students. So what level are they at? It could tell you and analyze your school program, whether or not you're effective. And it could be that it's how successful your program is at the end of the year. So what assessment are you using at the end of the year to determine this? So turn to your partner and give them one measure that you consider as your summative. So this measure that you're using for summative, at a state level, what we require is that you've determined your assessment for accountability for the most place, right? And if you're in public education and if you're doing third through 12th grade, they've told you which assessment you have to use, right? Okay. But most states don't require a must for K-2. So then a lot of them, it is up to the districts, site-based decisions. Some districts say it's a school decision. And that's where it kind of gets muddy, especially in the K-2 system. So when, I, when you're looking at the assessments, if you're in a, a district or if you're in a collection of schools, I ask you to start be thinking about conversations with your administrators. Is there something that we can measure across schools? So it's apples to apples. So that we can start looking at kids and are we being successful? So that's what a summative assessment does. It's really looking for how the kids did after we finished our instruction. So it could be mid-semester at middle school and high school, right? It could be at the end of a chapter. <clears throat> so it doesn't mean just one of these. Anything that you use after instruction at the end is typically considered summative. Then we have what's called a universal screener. They also talk about benchmark assessments. Universals are different than benchmark, and we're going to talk about what they mean. So what is a universal screener? A universal screener usually is given two, three, or four times a year. 
It identifies who may be at risk. It helps us to monitor students' progress. Or it could predict students' likelihood to success in the program that you're doing, either reading instruction or math. So a universal screener is really a brief assessment that you're given to all students. But in middle school and high school, that's hundreds of kids in some of our public schools. So in middle school and high school, the universal screener might be a little bit different than what we do in K-12. So for middle school and high school, we might take that summative assessment that they took last year and use that as our first sift. We look at who's at grade level or who's not. Or we might say, can we look at uh, their grades from last year? Who's passed their classes and who hasn't? Maybe we look at attendance. So there's risk indicators that we could use for this universal screener for middle school and high school beyond just a Dibbles or Ames Webb or, or the outcome from last year. Okay? So how is a universal different than a benchmark? Well, what a benchmark is what they can also call interims. So sometimes you'll hear them as benchmarks. Sometimes you'll hear them as interims. They are um, periodically throughout the school year. And their function has three parts. Number one, they're predictive. They predict readiness for skills. Number two, they evaluate. They evaluate the ongoing progress of students. And they're instructional. They provide student performance data. So, what makes benchmark or interim different than a universal screener? Twos, turn to your group and talk about it. What makes benchmarks or interims different than a universal screener? So turn to your group and talk about it. Twos, your turn. Universal screeners by state level expectations or as a uh, superintendent or a principal, I'll tell you what we consider a universal screener is what's given to all kids or how we first sift kids to see if there's any risk indicators. Benchmark or interims are things that we give along the way for checking to helping us as the outcome measures throughout the year. So remember, we had summative, that's at the very final, so benchmark and interims are those other checkpoints that is different than a progress monitoring. It's what we're doing at the end of something, okay? So that takes us to diagnostic. So we found kids, we've done our universal screener, we see, find kids who are at risk, we're trying to determine, we've now decided our district has already put benchmarks in place, so we already have those in, but we need to figure out why are they having difficulty. And um, in Arizona, we do a training, or did a training, I should say, um, the State Department, and we do a lot with um, CORE's assessing reading multiple measures because it's really easy to show and train general ed classroom teachers how they can dig a little bit deeper to find out why kids are having difficulties. Okay, so not all general ed teachers have access to speech pathologists and what they use, right, for their diagnostic. They don't have things in their toolbox. They're not like a special ed teacher that has some of the assessments that can be used for diagnostic. So what do we get in the hands of general ed classroom teachers? Something as simple as these. So what is a progress monitoring tool? It is monitoring. <laughs> That's what it's doing. It's a monitoring test for periodically, typically done weekly or biweekly, especially if you're doing a MTSS or RTI model. And it's used to gauge students' growth. It's targeting to the curriculum that you're providing, and it is, should be looking for mastery. It is measuring mastery on skills. What are we looking for when we do diagnostics? So it's really to dig deeper, trying to figure out why kids struggle 
in a specific skill. Then we have progress monitoring. Our oh, excuse me. I am so sorry. I read the wrong thing, didn't I? <laughs> OK. Let me go back. Diagnostic. So what is a diagnostic tool? Diagnostic is evidence gathering procedures that provide a sufficient, clear indication regarding which targeted skills a student possesses or doesn't possess. So if we need a phonological diagnostic, what do we have? If we need a decoding, do we have anything for vocabulary? What about spelling inventories? Those are all diagnostic. Now progress monitoring. Sorry, everyone. What is progress monitoring? These are d tests done periodically. They're targeted by the curriculum that you're doing. Some of them are curriculum-based measures. Or they're a product that you can purchase. There's a lot of free online ones. There's ones that the um, National Center, some of the McGrells, um, there's regional centers that have created a lot of these. And um, some of your states have. So progress monitoring is, are we checking for understanding? Who has access to that? Who has access to progress monitoring assessments? That is a good question. So it's uh, site-based decisions. It could be a district's decision. It could be a state's decision. So some states have already done an RFP and already um, looked at which ones um, are useful. In the state of Arizona, uh, it is a site-based decision. You can use whatever you want for any of the assessments except for summative. Um, that one is uh, federally mandated with um, requirements for third through 12th grade. So that's the only ones that um, are required. But most states, a lot of them have already done RFPs and done a, a, a suggested list uh, for more of them. I know Oregon is sitting here. They've been doing a lot of work. Um, Florida. Um, has done some. So a lot of the states, you can look up that. So what is formative? There's a lot of vendors out there that says, yes, our program is formative. So what truly is formative? Margaret Heritage is one of the authors of the um, document about this assessment system. So for them, they were talking about it is a process. That means it is what the teacher does to, with the student and how the student performs. So it's while you're teaching. So let's think about our assessments that we say are formative. If you're truly working with the student and you're observing what they're doing and you're collecting data, that's formative. If you've taught and then you put them in front of a computer and you assess, that is not formative. It is while you're teaching, you're collecting evidence and the data. So a lot of formative assessments you'll see coming out um, in the early childhood um, realm. You have um, Strategies Gold. Uh, not only do they have assessment system, but they also have lessons for the uh, preschool teachers to do. You have projects like North Carolina has created a formative assessment for K uh, kindergarten readiness, kindergarten inventory, but they're trying to get into third grade. And again, it's more of a, whole, uh, a holistic approach. I'm not saying any of these are good. I'm just providing what's out there. <laughs> and then you have Margaret Heritage working with WestEd, and she's creating the formative assessments tied to the Common Core standards. So we have teachers who are starting to say, if this, this is the standard I'm teaching, then I'm teaching it. And while I'm teaching, I'm collecting evidence. That's formative assessment. So ones or threes, turn to your partner. I want you to talk about, do you have formative assessments? While you're teaching, do you have some formal way of collecting data and having that talk with either the other teachers, with the parents, what do you have as your formative assessment? So a lot of times, if you're listening to what is formative assessments, a lot of um, the vendors or, or products should be talking about learning progressions. What does that continuum of learning look like? 
and how are we measuring that while we're teaching? Could be talking about learning goals and criteria success. Or they might be using evidence of learning. Feedback loop. Have you heard of that? That's what formative assessment is, a feedback loop. Sometimes it's self or peer monitoring where kids start taking that ownership and they're monitoring their own progress. That's process. That's formative assessment, especially for older kids. Or it's asking the kids to be collaborating with each other and how they have that discussion. And as a teacher is walking around and absorb, observing, is she making notes? Is she tagging out, oh, okay, I see that they get that. Especially in preschool and kindergarten, we walk around with a clipboard all the time, right? And we have certain skills that we're observing. That's formative assessment. All those. So it doesn't have to be a formalized product. It's the process that you're doing. So I want you to really be thinking about that as we're listening to what the researchers are asking us, especially in general education with the Common Core and the expectations, you're going to hear more about formative assessments and not the summative. So now that we've talked about a general understanding about assessments, now I want to be thinking about the system in which you have your assessments. So you have the student, you have minute by minute, which is now I'm telling you, or what kind of assessments measure minute by minute process. We call it formative, right? So what do we do daily? Is that benchmarks interims or are those formative assessments we, measure, we collect daily? Formative. It wouldn't be summative, right? What about a spelling test? That would be some of it. Is that done on a day? It's done after a period. It's done after a period. Okay, so maybe that's weekly, right? Because most teachers do, you know, spelling tests, and then they give it at the end of the week. So maybe that's, that's. So what are we using to measure weekly? Progress monitoring, right? Okay. Could be doing summative if you're in a... Um, a curriculum that uh, it could be um, could be um, benchmarks interims right are you are you expecting it weekly or most likely it's monthly right or or it could be quarterly quizzes, be quizzes would quizzes be considered benchmarks well let's think about this quizzes are done when midway through, midway through. so are we talking about is that weekly unit quarterly it depends on how you want it. So that's why I'm asking. There's no cut right, right, right. So now I want you to be thinking about, and now here I am, a third grade teacher, and my district is expecting us to have a whole set of assessments we're given every year. And we're saying, oh, I love dibbles, and I want to give it all the time. And then another teacher says, but we want to do DRA, running records. And then another one says, oh, I think spelling inventories are good. And then another one says, oh, but it's expected that we now have a new curriculum and we are going to do the curriculum-based measures. And now as a third grade teacher, I'm sitting there going, stop. When am I supposed to be teaching? Right? So as a leadership, do you map out a school calendar? When we're going to give the tests, for what reason and why? So think about the system in which you're creating it. So really looking at which assessments do you determine, determine as your long term to measure the length of a student's learning? Which ones do you determine middle, medium? And which ones do you determine as our short? So I'm going to give you a minute to write down which ones do you consider are your long-term assessments? Which ones do you determine your medium? And which ones do you determine as your short? And write them down for reading and literacy. So in a minute, just think about that and write it down. Short means more frequently. Medium means your interim, your benchmarks. Long-term means, what do you consider the end of your program? 
Is that different than what you're using right now? And sometimes we have to have those hard questions. I've used this assessment all the time. But is it really the best? Am I getting what I need? What's not in there is your diagnostic because that's specific to your student and needs. It's all the other ones that you have to consider. Okay, turn to your neighbor and have a conversation. What was your aha about the assessments? When you go to school or your clinic come Monday, what are you going to consider differently? So turn to your partner and talk about that. What did you just learn? And what would you change if you could come Monday? For those of you that came in after I started, on the IDA website, the handouts that I'm going to be uh, referring to, the second part of this presentation is there. I, we had a couple, um, I did a presentation a couple months ago and they were left over, so I stuck them in my suitcase and brought them. Um, so there are some um, people out there that have some of the handouts, but I just want you to know they are on the website. And if you can't find them or have difficulties, um, at the end is my email address. You can always email me, and I'll give you the documents for them. So now we're going to talk about, so that was a general understanding of what assessment systems uh, in public education, what we're always looking at, and how do we look at it to drive instructions. And it could help you as you're working with schools in your own practices or if you're a parent. Now we're going to talk about what do we do with that data. What can you help lead that discussion if you're going to have data discussions with teachers, administrators? So first of all, we have to understand that there are two types of protocols when you're looking at assessments. You have what's called a standard protocol and you have a problem solving. Standard protocol usually means that there's a set the rules, we always do it this way, this is how we're going to look at the data, and that's how we do things. Problem solving is a little bit, you know, there's almost like a, a, we keep going around. So we look at the data, we do some instruction, we make some decisions, kind of change and tweak, okay? And it kind of moves and evolves the system, okay? Standard protocol is we're all trained this way, this is how we do it, we're going to administer, and we make sure that we're fidel. Okay, so it doesn't matter which type of protocol, be consistent or move between the two. Uh, personally, I kind of go between a standard protocol to a problem solving because it's based on the team that I'm working with or the student, uh, the teachers. So when we talk about what are we using to uh, look at our database decision, we need to collect our, our unit screening information so that we can look at how the students are doing. We're measuring the response to instruction, so whether or not we formally have an RTI or MTS system, it is best practices. We look at what evidence-based decision-making rules, so we should have common rules that our team or our school or our district, how we look through that data, and we have to have communication and partnership, collaboration with our teams, with the parent and the school. So how do we form those? Those are really important. Oh, so let me go back. Um, Kennewick, Washington, uh, in 2000, I think it was in 99, um, they went down the route of looking at an RTI model before RTI was. They had third grade students and they had less than 30% of our stu their students ma uh, making um, expectations of their grade level expectation at the school. So the principal said, we got to change things. We don't have kids reading. So Kennewick, Washington went down their journey, and this is what they learned. They realized that they had some third grade students, less than a third, <laughs> about a third, who were at grade level. Great. But they had two-thirds of the kids who were two or more years behind. And they said, what does the research tell us? Well, research says if we just implement an evidence-based core reading program, let's see what happens. So they put a core reading program in place, and they had the students who were here, the third graders who are two years behind, here are the third graders who are at grade level. Well, the third graders who are at grade level grew a whole year. 
but the students who were two or more years behind grew a half a year. Okay, but they were growing, right? So, what happened? After four years, if they kept that trajectory, what was going to happen? They're gonna, yeah, the gap widens. They, after a year, they said, okay, this isn't good. <laughs> we can't keep them. So their progress monitoring data was telling them they're only growing a half a year while their peers are growing a year. Uh, we can't do that. So then the following year said, okay, we're going imp to implement the core. We're going to keep doing that, but we need to provide intervention. So they put in some interventions. Let's look at the data. Small group instruction targeting on the skills. So, oh, our data is telling us our interventions are growing a year. Great, right? What happens after four years? They're still two years behind. Okay, the third year, they're like, okay, we can't keep that up because we're still going to be in the place that we are. So maybe we need to add more intensive groups. Let's make smaller group sizes, intensify, and the duration, the time of the day or how long we're working with the kids. Maybe just three days a week, 15 minutes a day isn't working it, right? Maybe we now do five days a week and it's now 30 minutes. So let's look what happens. So here they have, oh, our data is showing that these intervention groups are growing 18 months. So four years later, working with it, they didn't just give up. The kids matched their peers. So that's what this book was about. So we know it can happen if we build the systems that are needed. We have to collaborate and work together. So what does that look like? How do we have that discussion? Well, as um, Keith Stanovich says, if we keep looking at those that have, keep having, and those that don't, keep don't. Okay, so this is called the Matthew effect. So it's really saying that we have to change that Matthew effect. I'm sorry, I didn't catch what you said. What, what study was that? Uh, the previous one? The one where the kids closed. Oh, that was the um, Kennewick, Washington, the catch up growth. Okay. And uh, this is. Um, uh, Stanovich's Matthew effect is really saying those that uh, struggle will continue to struggle, those that um, are, but that we can change as long as we're looking at the data. But also, the research says if we intervene early, which we heard all these three days, in kindergarten, 30 minutes every day, we can catch up those kids. If we wait till third grade, it takes two and a half hours every day to catch up. And if we wait until seventh grade, seven and a half hours a day. We don't have that time, do we? So we really have to intervene early. So when we, yes? What was the kindergarten you said kindergarten? 30 minutes every day. And what study was that? Um, I'm sorry. Where is that from? Just Well, Joe Torgerson talked about it. Um, a lot of the research when we were in Reading First in 2003 um, and 2007, we continued to find that, that if we can intervene in, thir in kindergarten 30 minutes every day, and that when we get into first, second, and third grade, it starts getting longer, you have to figure out. But as a general classroom teacher in a public education, can I get 30 minutes to 45 minutes every day working with kids? I'll tell you, it's really hard unless I have support from the superintendent and the principal and that we are collaborating with general ed and special ed and reading interventionist. Um, so it does. So in the handouts, I, I kind of shared with you that uh, protocol, okay? And this is an example of what you can do. Here's a K-1, here's a 2-3, and a 4-12. And the 412 is actually taken from um, the core assessment book at the very back of it. It has this flow chart. Um, but even FCRR has a flow chart. There's a lot of um, resources out there. So I'm going to talk about and walk you through what a flow chart would look like if you're working with a leadership team on data and assessments. Up here, you're looking for students who are either at grade level or below grade level. So when we look at it, last year's outcome data. So if you're third through 12th grade, we're looking at last year's outcome data. If you're using a universal screener, this is where the universal screener goes. Who's got it and who doesn't. If they have not passed 
the universal screener or the, uh, let's say, state assessment. Let's say we're talking about third grade. So we have um, our, in Arizona, we call it AZ Merit. Um, they didn't pass, so now we're going to do an oral reading fluency. That's quick and easy, right? It takes three minutes to five minutes, depending on how many measures, if you're doing it um, that way. Then you look at who's inaccurate versus who's accurate based on an oral reading fluency. If they're accurate, this group of students, that data, you're now making a group where this is where they are. They're focusing on fluency building. They're focusing on word phrase, text level. If they are inaccurate, then you're going to do a diagnostic. You have to figure out why are they inaccurate. So you're going to do a phonics screener or a spelling inventory. Okay? Here's the spelling inventory, or you're going to do morphology if it's for older kids. If they are significantly behind, you have a third grader who doesn't even know short vowels versus vowel consonant E or anything like that, well, then you're, you need to go into the phonological processor and decide, do they even recognize sounds? Can they determine syllables? So that takes you. So the darker the, co the color of the square, that's where your instructional group is now. So you're going to be able to start taking this and shifting and making groups of kids. And then that helps you drive what your small group instruction. Because remember I said in public education, we have too many kids who are at risk. And we can't do one-on-one -on -one therapy. We have to start doing small groups. If you're over here and they are at, they pass the oral reading fluency, then we start looking at vocabulary comprehension. And what is that considered? So I gave you some examples of a, a flow chart considering a questions. So that's to determine how I'm going to group my kids. So I'm, I've taken the data. I've done the flow chart. I now have like six different groups of kids. In public education, that's probably what happens in a general ed classroom. We have about six kids. We try to keep it from three to five kids. Um, so now I'm going to have to do some progress monitoring data, right? Okay. And how am I going to determine whether or not my progress monitoring is going well? Well, I gave you another document. And it, we need to look at that data three ways. The first way is, do we look at the data and see three to five consecutive data points be below the aim line? And I'm going to show you a, an example on what we mean by an aim line if you're not familiar with progress monitoring. Number two, do we have three to five consecutive data points above the, date, the aim line? Or do we have them where they're going up and down the aim line? So if they're below the aim line, the questions we have to ask is, has the student been present in the intervention? Or have they been missing? Have we been interrupted in our intervention? We always have fire drills. <laughs> or there's the field trip or something. Is the student lacking motivation and engagement? Maybe the, the, there's no spark in this group, and the teacher is a perky pace, and these kids aren't working together. Have you ever had that group? They're just not jiving, are they? Okay. Or is the intervention matched? Maybe we're working on the wrong skill. You know, those are the questions. So it's not the student's fault. It's us as educators. We have to be looking at it and determining why is it. Okay? Or if it's above the aim line, there are questions to ask, or if they're up and down. So this is just a, a tool to use to think through your data. So when we talk about aim line, oh, wow, when this I'm sorry, that green line is supposed to be on that black line. Somehow uh, displaying that has shifted. <laughs> so this green line is supposed to be up here on this black line. Okay, this is actually a true data of a student that, um, a, a, from a school I was working on. He is, uh, started off in third grade. Okay, And um, if you look right here, he started in third grade. He should be at 110 words per minute. He was down at... 20 or 50, no, yeah, that's about 45 words per minute. So he was significant. And they were doing interventions. Look, was he above the line, below the line, or up and down the line? 
kind of below and up and down, right? There wasn't a lot. I mean, he was kind of actually above the line. One, two, three, four out of the six dots were above the line. So that intervention was doing pretty well. But you know what? Administrators decided, come January, we purchased a new intervention for our district. And guess what? All the teachers were trained in this, in this intervention. And guess what this teacher had to do? This new intervention, right? So we said, OK, uh, I'm all for this. No problem. Let's watch the data. Well, oops, we continued to watch that data. And I asked them, are you meeting to talk about this student? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. We've got to be fidelity to this program. We've got to keep doing it. So what's happening to his date, data? It's going down. It's below the line. And we didn't have this questionnaire. If I had this questionnaire, what would I have said? Hmm, let's look about that. So by the end of the year, I did have that questionnaire. And we started having that discussion. I said, so what did we find out? What should we have done with this intervention? We need, we, so guess what we did? <laughs> At the beginning of fourth grade, we switched back and we said, OK, how many of these kids really need this intervention? And look what happened. The principal was bought into this. Oh, so some of the groups needed this other intervention. And this kid and this group needed this intervention. Oh, so sometimes we need more than one intervention, right? And we need to be thinking about that. But we also have to talk about how does this intervention tie to what's happening in the core in the classroom? Because Mary, if she's learning one thing and a routine in the inner intervention, how do we connect it for her when she gets back into her regular ed classroom? And that's always, that's the hardest part with a system to be doing that. So. Turn to your partners and talk about this progress monitoring data. Do you have discussions down to this level? Watching that, those points and having that question and knowing where do we change by alterable variables in progress monitoring. So turn to your neighbor and talk about this tool. So in the past, we've always thought if we assess good if we instruct, great. We just give tests, and we just instruct. And we're going down the road, and we're just doing all that, and we think, this is great. We're showing progress. And what is the NAEP, skill, NAEP test telling us? No, we're not making any progress. What we really need to when we say integration of assessment and instruction, it really is integration. So again, we need to be thinking about our assessments, the questions how we're monitoring, how we're progressing through the system for the school year and with these students. So the good news I can tell you, and they keep telling us research, we can teach 95% of these students. And we can get them to grade level. But it's a lot of work. And we've got to be thinking about our assessments we're giving to drive our instruction. So I'm going to briefly talk about, so what do we do? Now we've been monitoring. Now we've been looking at it. And we need to start doing some adjustments. So we have to look at our instruction. And our belief systems sometimes have to be questioned. Are we actually doing what we're supposed to be doing? Because the data is telling us differently. So I want to quickly do a review. You see the simple view a lot, um, Goff and Tumner. We really need to be thinking about that word reading. And what we do with language comprehension, you've seen this a lot um, during the conference. Also, if you don't know about Scarborough's, uh, Hollis Scarborough, I love this. Every training, I have to figure out how to put this. Because really, when we talk about word reading and language comprehension, this is what we're talking about. So word reading, we all know this. Phonological decoding the six-syllable types. Uh, si um, um, whole word reading or our sight word reading, um, all that is important. And Hollis was telling us, you know, these are the strands, and we need to have them together. And if one is not strong, that strand starts falling off, and we're not a very strong rope, are we? When we talk about language comprehension, it starts down in preschool. We have to do a lot of language. And what research is telling us, background knowledge, vocabulary, language structure, understanding about syntax, vocabulary, 
Uh, also in language structure, metaphors, similes, understanding that. When we talk about literacy knowledge, you know, opening up the book, left to right, making sure it's in the right direction. But it's also genres, text structures, all that. So in the language comprehension, while we look at our measures, which one has the highest probability to help us understand comprehension? Is it background knowledge? Is it vocabulary knowledge? Is it language structure? Vo verbal reasoning? Or is it literacy knowledge? So which one do you think it is? Show me, one for background knowledge, two for vocabulary, three for language, four for verbal, or five for literacy knowledge. What do you think? Oh, wow, I see the kind of combination. One or two, I don't see many, three or four or five. Okay, well, if you said two, you are correct. Vocabulary, but you can't get vocabulary without background knowledge, okay? But for assessing comprehension, the best measure that we have and what we really look at is vocabulary. But we can't, we know background knowledge helps us to build vocabulary. And, of course, we need to understand what's happening in the brain and where is the breakdown. Are we talking about, is it in the phonological processor? Right down here. So when we talk about phonology and um, uh, phonemes, that's all happening in the phonological processor up here in the frontal lobe. Are we talking about spelling? Are we talking about word reading? Then we are also tied between the phonological processor with the orthographic to help us understand reading and connected text. But once we start reading, and now we're going to build vocabulary. Where is vocabulary happening? Right up here above the temporal lobe where the lexicon holds. And then we have to understand multiple meanings and words in context. And then we start understanding similes and metaphors. And all that language comprehension is happening right up here in the parietal. But this is a simple view of how that mapping is occurring on the left side of the brain. And if we're doing dibbles or aims, let's take our summative assessment. Which measures is our state summative assessment really looking at? Is it doing all four? No. So it's usually doing the context and the meaning. It's really getting into vocabulary and comprehension. And vocabulary, it's really saying, uh, give it a sentence, you got a word in the sentence, and it says, what does this word mean? And find other words that mean that. I mean, that's the, pretty much the, the most of the vocabulary. If we use Dibbles, Ames Webb, what is it measuring? Which one of these are we getting that information from? And are we progress monitoring that growth? If we're giving a spelling inventory, which one of these processors are we measuring? If we give an end of the unit test, what are we actually measuring? If we're giving a curriculum based measure from the pro, um, product that we're doing or online, what is it actually measuring? And then you have to crosswalk them and say, are we over assessing a certain processor? Are we actually doing two tests that are measuring the same processor? Should we use that much time to assess the same processor? I'm asking you to think about that. So I'm not asking you to throw away the baby with the bathwater. I'm just asking you to think about it in a different way. When you're using an assessment, what are you truly measuring in this processor, in the brain? When we talk about assessments for dyslexia, we're looking for the phonological deficit, the fluency, rapid automatic naming, the language comprehension. So what assessments are measuring those to determine our placements, right? Well, also, we can think about our assessments to how do we make groups. So we had that flow chart, but we really need to help us understand. A typical reader has both a strong in language and a strong in word reading. How many kids, when we look at all the data, tells us they're in strong in all of those in a classroom? It's usually 5 to 15% in most of the schools that I work with. <laughs> 
So now we're talking about 85% are in these other three categories. So what does it mean when we say dyslexic? Well, that's why we're here. We know it's a phonological deficit. We know a lot of them have difficulty in both decoding and reading and, and spelling problems. A lot of them have motor planning problems. There's, so it's not this easy. A lot of them have multiple areas of difficulty, right? But a compensator is one, these are the kids that actually fly underneath the radar. They're just average and everything. <laughs> and they're not strong word readers. They're kind of like average to below average. They're not strong in language comprehension. They're average to below average. How many are we really talking about in there? The hyperlexic, these are the kids that they can read anything in front of you, but they can't comprehend a thing. We call them the word caller, right? A lot of times our high Asperger's autistic children, they can read anything, but boy, when you talk about language or having any conversations, okay. And then, how many kids are in this mixed? And as I said, they have a combination of all that. So when we're looking at our assessments and we're making our groups and we're doing our flow chart, you've got to think of this in the back of our mind to help generally classroom teachers to figure out, okay, this is whole group, but when I want to do small group, what is my focus for instruction here? Comprehension and vocabulary, right? What's my focus right here? They don't need comprehension unless they're a compensator. They need word reading, right? And what is our focus here? Word reading, language comprehension, everything, right? So now that kind of helps us drive that instruction. So I gave, added a document. This um, was during our Reading First Times University of Oregon help, but it's a progression of skills that you can give to teachers to help them. This is tied to our Common Core Standards in Appendix A. Appendix A is a supplemental document for the Common Core standards. So if your state has Common Core or something like Common Core, they just modified it, they still probably have Appendix A somewhere. It's just they didn't want to be Common Core states. Um, Arizona is one of them. Um, so this is tied to Appendix A. And you can do a crosswalk and show the skills that you see in Appendix A are the same that are shown progression here. So you can start saying, if a diagnostic is showing that they have a difficulty in phonological awareness, in phonemic awareness, what is our intervention including? What are those sub-skills? Do we need a diagnostic that actually measures some of those sub-skills? Do we have a diagnostic in our building or in our own toolbox that covers these sub-skills? We might need to go back into our assessment and analyze it to determine. If it's word reading, does it cover all of these types of skills? When we're talking about fluency, does it do fluency at the word level, phrase level, sentence level, text level? Or is it just text and words? You know, thinking about questioning our materials, our own toolbox, what we have. Do we have all the pieces that we need or are we missing some? And thinking about our toolbox. Vocabulary, not only sight words, but thinking about academic vocabulary. And then comprehension. And comprehension is probably one of the hardest because there are so many different skills in comprehension. But if you don't know of um, Center on Instruction, uh, what I like about Center on Instruction, they have a document, it's free to download for informational text structure. And they have graphic organizers and signal words for each type of comprehension or, or um, text structures like compare and contrast, um, uh, uh, sequencing, um, it might be, um, I'm trying to think, right, persuasive. Uh, Right, so it's a really good document um, to show. Center on instruction, informational text structure, 
template. I think that's what it's called, informational text structure template. And you go to centeroninstruction.org. So I want to remind you that it's not about the student that's causing the performance. It's not the student that is causing the performance gap, but it's the interaction with the curriculum, the assessment, and how we're analyzing it to determine how the student is progressing. It is us to look at that. Too many times we think that Mary is going to be able to connect the dots as she goes from the interventionist or special ed teacher to general ed or from school to home. And we have to realize there's so many things that's happening with Mary that she's just trying to stay above water. So how can we help? And of course, Mary Ann Wolf, I always say, we have in general ed 720 days, write that down, from the day they enter kindergarten to the day they exit third grade. We only have 720 days to get them reading. And that reading took us 2,000 years to get where we are now. So reading is not simple, and that it takes a lot of what's happening in preschool and what we do all about oral language and language development to get us there. So as I said, 720 days from kindergarten to third grade, an average. Now what happens if they're sick? They go on a field trip. Uh, there's a fire drill. Um, you know, uh, there's a snow day. There's a hurricane that comes through. And so just think about what's happened this year and how many kids do not have 720 days. And these things are affecting our general ed kids and our special ed kids in public education, unless we can figure out this. So I want to thank you. I'm here to answer any questions, but I know my time is limited because we have a half an hour to get to our next session. So any questions? <laughs>